What's up, what's up? It's a Spiracle, and this is Ho Ho and the Fabulous Gays. This was done by M. Keating for the NB Jam this year. A cute little non-binary flag there with a little controller. And, um, full disclosure, I did get a couple of screens into this game before I realized that Bandicam wasn't recording my microphone. <laughs> so, um, what I did learn, just for a little bit of background, that this is the titular character, Ho Ho. Uh, they are non-binary, and they're fucking gorgeous. Like, I want to look like that, can I just say. Um, and another thing about this game is that it is, it uh, as so far appears to be entirely text-based, so there aren't any pictures, there aren't any videos, um, and if that sounds like a cool thing, it's part story, part game, then go ahead and go on this journey with me, otherwise I'm sure there's, uh, other videos that would strike your fancy, but otherwise, uh, let's get into it. This is just, uh, explaining that this is a piece of interactive fiction. It's essentially a novel that you can interact with, but let's go ahead and take our seats. Your name is Hoshi. Hoshi Hoshinaga. Some of your friends like to refer to you as Ho-Ho. You are 25 years of age, you have fair skin, your hair is pitch black and quite long, you have a feminine figure and often dress in crop tops and skirts. You wear these because you like the way they look on you, they compliment your figure. But even though most of your wardrobe is feminine, you do not see yourself as female, or male for that fact. You are not the only one who feels like this, some of your friends do not fit with their assigned genders, and thus you address each other with the singular pronoun they and them. Of course, gender and social expectations are not the only problems you and your friends face. These are absolutely nothing compared to the things you battle on an everyday basis. This is another thing. These guys are basically like dream Power Rangers. Is that a spoiler? I don't know, but it's really cool. It's really cool. So let's, let's just... Hoshi, you live in a strange world. The last couple years of your life have been filled with bizarre misadventures. You have gained allies, though your enemies still outnumber you. You used to worry about bills and parties, and you still do, but these are mere distractions now. They're, they're silvery stars, tiny and insignificant against a sea of black. Today, the tide rises. At this moment, you are napping. It's the middle of the day on a Sunday. Summer is almost over, though it appears that the heat has yet to hear about this. Outside, the sky is light blue and the sun is shining bright. You may be indoors with your head resting on the surface of a cool pillow, but you are not in this world. You are dreaming. Step into the dream. You open your eyes. The world around you is a familiar one. This is the place you visit in your dreams. The people here refer to it as the Tower of the Dead, or Aruman. This is the place everyone goes to during the momentary death that we all call sleep. You are dead right now. Your soul has been transposed out of the living realm and into Aruman. Of the many doubles of the tower, you happen to reside on the second. On this level, everything is orange. The floor at your feet is made of tile, and it is arranged in many geometric patterns that do not ever repeat. Above you, the sky is orange. There are no clouds and no sun. There is no need for a sun. Darkness does not exist in Anuman. You look at yourself and see that your everyday clothes have been replaced. The crop top and skirt you are wearing in the waking world are no more. Instead, you are wearing what appears to be an orange toga. 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 In the dreaming world, everyone appears to be wearing togas. Or if not, some form of tunic or one-piece clothing. You and your friends have asked the denizens of Aruman as to why everyone seems to be wearing the same thing, though you have never gotten a good answer. We just do, they'd say. You hated hearing that. It was clear that Aruman did not follow the rules of the physical realm. After all, there was a light without a sun or flame, though the source of all light in the dreaming world was more of a primal question. The reason why everyone appears to be wearing togas, that still escapes you. It seemed that any other piece of clothing would not make as much sense. At least you're happy it was togas and not clown suits. <laughs> Suddenly, you hear a familiar voice coming from somewhere behind you. The voice is gentle and sweet. You know this person. Who is it? You turn around. A couple feet behind you is a bench. It appears to be made of orange marble, much like all of the structures in this level of Aruman. 
There is a young woman sitting on the bench. She is one of your dear friends. You two are the same age, though she looks a lot younger than you. You two have known each other for a long while. Her name is Makoto, though everyone calls her Mako. Mako has short hair, she often cuts it herself, and it is a mess of pastel colors. If you were to squint your eyes, you'd think that someone had tie-dyed her head. And that's so cool. I want to have a head of sunset one day, Just eventually. In the real world, she often dresses in denim shorts and loosely fitting long sleeve shirts. In the dreaming world, though, she's wearing a toga, just like everybody else. You walk towards Mako and take a seat right next to her. As soon as you do, she speaks once again in her gentle and sweet voice. Hey, Ho-Ho, you're napping, aren't you? Before you can even say anything, Mako smiles. Of course you're napping. It's the middle of the day on a Sunday. There's no way you could gather the energy to meditate at this hour. Sleeping is not the only way to access Aruman. If it was, you and your friends would never have been able to project your true potential. No, sleep is just the most natural way to transpose the soul. Meditation is another. Through the act of meditation, a person could align the lenses of their mind, as though picking a lock, and open a path into Aruman. The soul would be transposed into that alternate realm of existence, and a person's willpower would serve as the tether connecting it to the physical world. It was in this way that you and your friends trained, though it was anything but easy. Mako knows she's right, but you wonder if maybe you should still try to convince her otherwise. Um, I elected to tell Mako the truth because uh, she can see through my uh, terrible lie. I'm still beat from last night, you say. Mako looks at you. She nods, causing her mismatched pastel bangs to shake up and down. Same. I ended up going to bed at 5 in the morning. I think I woke up once, ate some food, then went back to bed immediately. I've been here all day. There was a time when you and your friends used to stay up all night having fun. And that's not entirely true anymore. Sometimes it is fun, but what happened last night was anything but that. You take a second to gather your thoughts. You page through the immediate memory in the back of your mind. Last night, you and the rest of your fabulous friends spent hours chasing after a rogue Aruma. In the ancient language of the Tharo, Aruma meant one of several things, and none of which were easily translated into a living tongue. In the dreaming world, you've heard people referring to the Aruma as the subject within the object, as though the clay within a mold. One of your friends liked to think of them as the thread that linked together the fabric of the self. Neither of these explanations seem to convince you, though. To you, Arumas were easier to explain in motion than in conversation. You first came in contact with your own Arumas through the dreaming world, and it was through this link that your bond with them became stronger. You and your friends don't know all there is to know about the nature of the soul or the dreaming world. What you do know, though, is that everyone in the world is linked to at least one Aruma. It is the tether that links them to one of the many levels in Aruman. Unfortunately, when a person ceases to exist in the physical realm, they leave behind more than just a corpse. Sometimes they leave behind their Arumas. These are known as rogues, and they are invisible to the human eye. All of the great natural disasters in history were caused by rogue Arumas. You have seen what they can do, and you know this to be true. I'd like, this is really intense. It's heavy. All these 20-somethings fighting off the things that have caused every natural disaster in human history. It's deep. You nearly caught the thing, but it managed to flee. It's entirely likely that it may never come back into this side of the city, but it's not exactly what you would call a moral victory, or really any kind of victory. You feel the center of your forehead hurt. It seems you've been frowning pretty hard. Mako, of course, notices. She looks up at you, but her voice is anything but confident. She struggles to even make herself heard. If you didn't know any better, you would have thought it was a mouse talking. Is everything okay? You're not worried about that rogue, right? Well, I'm sure it's gone. We'll probably never hear of it ever again. You hope that Mako is right. You really do, but you can't handle talking about this right now. The memory is too fresh. You took a nap to escape the very thought of a rogue Aruma on the loose. Let's change the subject. You reach out and put one arm around Mako. You bring her in close and even though you can see her rolling her eyes, you notice her smile a little. You clear your throat and speak in your favorite rotten voice. For a handful of seconds, you speak as though you were just another 20-something in the city, as though there was nothing particularly scary or bizarre in your life. It feels amazing. 
Mako, can you believe that summer is almost over and we have yet to hit one of the ice cream parlors downtown? You begin. We used to go there once a week back when we were in school. Why don't we go there sometime soon? Just you and me like old times. You notice Mako's smile widen, but only for a fraction of a second. Suddenly, you feel a prickly sensation on the back of your neck as though a razor blade is brushing up against your skin. Out of the corner of your eye, you can almost make out a shadowy figure hovering just behind Mako's shoulders. It appears you are not the only one to notice this. Shush, I can get ice cream with whoever I want, Mako says, waving her hand as though batting away a fly. You know she's not saying this to you, but rather to someone very close to her. Someone so close, actually, that they're a part of her soul. Loveless doesn't really like me, huh? You say. Sometimes I wish she was a lot, a lot more like yours, or Kami's. Sometimes all my Anuma does is complain. Mako rolls her eyes, as though ignoring the reply of someone who is both invisible and inaudible. Yes, that's harsh, but it's also true. Also, I'm clearly not in any danger, so go and rest, you overprotective parent wannabe. You can't help but smile. Your life is anything but normal, but it is still fun. Sometimes things are scary and dangerous, but there is still laughter to be had. This is the light that keeps you moving forward. Schedule a Sunday date with Mako! So, how about I drop by your place in an hour or so? Mako looks up as though doing some quick mental arithmetic. From one second to the next, she turns to look at you. Works for me. God damn it, Panic. It's my cat. Uh, guys, gals, and non-binary pals. Um, anyway. Works for me. That, that means I gotta wake up now and shower. You can see a little sweat drop slide down the side of Mako's face. This can only mean one thing. You open your mouth to speak, your lips trembling. You didn't shower last night? But Mako, the rogue covered you and Kami in sludge. Please don't tell me that you went to bed covered in the stuff. Sludge. Um, this basically says that uh, rogue Arumas don't have a physical form to manifest into, so they take on whatever uh, physical thing most relates to the spiritual thing that they embody. Like, uh, a rogue Aduma with a tendency for starting fires cannot be stopped by firemen showing up, since that fire would be equal parts physical and spiritual. And they got uh, splattered with blobs of sludge. <laughs> Mako's face suddenly becomes a bright shade of red. She holds her arms in front of her as though to stop the conversation. She opens her mouth to speak, but her words are too few and far in between. Uh, I was... I, I mean, we were... Mako doesn't even have the heart to finish the sentence. Poor thing, you say. You reach out and softly pat Mako on the, on the head. Well, if it makes you feel any better, I can pick you up in an hour and a half. Maybe two hours. One hour's fine, Mako says, biting her bottom lip. I'll have Loveless help me, even if she doesn't really want to. Mako shakes her head as though dismissing the words of a third speaker, present but unseen. Mako takes a deep breath. You watch as she closes her eyes and begins to slowly regulate her breathing. If you didn't know better, you would think that Mako had a parachute on her back and was about to jump out the door of a plane. One hour, Mako says. Her voice sounds faint, even if she is right there next to you. I'll be waiting. See you in an hour, Hoho. -ho. And then, without warning, Mako's body just vanishes. Had it been a magician's trick, you would have been terribly disappointed. There was no flash, no flame, not even a faint trail of smoke to mark where Mako had been a second prior. Nothing. One second she had been there, next to you, and the next she was gone. Mako had left the dream, and emerged back in the waking world. You take a deep breath. A part of you wonders if you should try sneaking in a little more rest, but you know that you'll probably stay in the dream all day if given the chance. And you can't do that. You have a date with your friend Mako. You take a deep breath. You try to relax your body. In the dream, your body is nothing but a projection of your willpower. In your mind's eye, you imagine the fabric of your flesh expanding and contracting. You see within yourself a desert of white sand. Above, the sky is as dark as your hair. Within that pocket universe, you find for yourself a precious focus. You take a deep breath. You look deeper within yourself. In a moment of impossible geometry, you reach within yourself. Time and space meld into a kaleidoscope of colors. You reach out to the desert within you, to the white sand that does not exist, and yet it does. 
You reach out. You take it. You feel it between your fingers. You look up at this imaginary world, a dream within a dream. You look at the black sky of your pocket dimension, and then you begin to feel a hugging sensation on the center of your chest, as though someone pulling back on a slingshot of which you are the bullet. Suddenly, your vision is a blur of motion, of light and darkness, sensations and numbness. Within a second of transition, you are both alive and dead. You leave the world of light and find yourself once again in the world of darkness. The waking world. Open your eyes. You open your eyes and find yourself back at the place you call home. It's small, a little cramped, but it is the nest to which you return at the end of every journey. You get up. Your bed is a mess of blankets, but you do not try to fix them. You tell yourself that there's no reason. After all, they're going to be messed up again in a few hours. I- same! Ho ho. I haven't made my bed in years. You do take a moment to pick up a plush off the floor. It must have fallen on you while you were tossing and turning. You reach down and pick it up. It's a plush in the shape of a watermelon slice. <laughs> it's so cute. Saying that watermelon is your favorite fruit is a little bit of an understatement. Watermelon is pretty much your favorite thing. There are just so many reasons. Watermelon is delicious. It's also healthy. Seedless watermelon is pretty much the best thing to eat ever and always. It's also very visually appealing. The green with the white stripes is a classic. But then you add the pink and black of the watermelon flesh and you have the key behind color theory in the 1990s. <laughs> Flashy, bright colors, super saturated, harsh contrasts. One time you joked that watermelon is life. But you weren't joking, you meant it. Watermelon is as crucial a part of your life as your morning cup of coffee. Watermelon candy, watermelon soda, watermelon gum, watermelon scented things, watermelon ice cream, watermelon! Mako once gifted you a pair of tiny watermelon shaped earrings and you were ready to get on one knee and propose to her there and then. You still think of those earrings and feel your heart skip a beat. <laughs> it's so cute. <laughs> you like to believe that you are tough as nails and you are. But if, so, if a random stranger were to gift you a watermelon, you are convinced that you would cry. You would just hold that watermelon in your arms and cry. Watermelon is life. <laughs> Let's go back. <laughs> it's big enough to double as a pillow when you have extra people sleeping over. Oh wow, that's a big watermelon slice. Which is often, your poor friend Keen doesn't have a place of his own and lives in a perpetual state of couch surfing. Ah oh, shit. That's rough. If anybody out there is couch surfing, more power to you. He's currently staying over at Kami's apartment. You... You wouldn't really refer to your place as an apartment. Technically it is, but technically it's also just a room in a large house. It's a makeshift college dorm, except none of the people living there are going to college. You live in a house full of strangers, and you all share the same bathroom. At least you don't all shower at the same time. You hold on to that thought as you grab a fresh crop top, your purse, and walk out of your room. You follow down the corridor and take the third door on the left, the only door without a name on it. This is the bathroom. Everything inside of it is blue. You're not sure why. The tile on the floor is blue, the wallpaper is a patchwork of blue lines and flowers. You close the door behind you. It's almost time. You reach into your purse and pull out your phone. You swipe your thumb across the surface, unlocking it. Man, I miss that mechanic. Why did iOS 10 take that anyway? You bring up your music application and shuffle it. This is all part of your ritual. This is your deck of tarot cards. You shuffle your musical library and reach for something to inspire you. Glorious rock riffs emerge through the speakers on your phone and you know. It's a sign. You reach out into your purse and pull out your tools. The bathroom's mirror is dirty, it always is, but it doesn't matter. That's not the canvas. You are the canvas. It's time. Put on your wall paint. I, I hope that was the actual song. It was it was made earlier this year. It might have been. Yes! Fall Out Boy! Several minutes later, you emerge from the bathroom. You are transformed. If prettiness was a stat on your character sheet, the little box would read on point. You go back to your room, slip your feet into a pair of flats, and throw your purse over one shoulder. You lock the door, make your way down to the first floor, and then out the front door. It is there that you are greeted by the sight of your loyal Singer Motor Stallion. It's the scooter that aided your escape. The people who once claimed to be your family, you left them behind a long time ago. That scooter has been with you since the beginning. As money came, you fixed it and printed it up. 
The current paint job is deep green like the shell of a watermelon, and there, on the side of the right panel, the words Juicy Lotus are painted. You and Lotus go back a long way. In your mind, you hope that it'll always be with you, leading you into whatever your next adventure is. Today, that adventure is a humble one. You are going to have ice cream with a dear friend of yours. It's not often that you two get to enjoy moments of peace, let alone moments of peace together. Thus, you cannot wait to get started. You slide your purse into the compartment, put your helmet on. It's all part of the, mem the ritual you've memorized. You hardly think about it twice as you go from step to step. Before you know it, you've pulled out of the driveway. You feel the wind against your face and the rumble of the engine all along your spine. The city is moving all around you. The city is not your city, but you've come to care for it. It's the place your friends call home, and for this reason you feel inspired to protect it. You take a turn at the right place and don't have to deal with a whole mess of one-way streets. You drive your scooter through a sidewalk, and then through the little path that splits a tiny park. Yes, you're not supposed to do that, but that's the least dangerous thing you've done all week. Last night, you and your friends found the spiritual remnant of a person's connection to the dreaming world, and then you fought it with your own spiritual projections of yourselves. You fended off the thing and pushed back a natural disaster for another day. This is reminding me a whole lot of Persona. I don't know if they were inspired by this or, or what, but I love it. I fucking love it. Persona is a great game. I just finished Persona 4 recently with uh, one of my friends and like, yes, A+, plus, good game. Uh, there were some writing flukes, but you know. Lives were saved, collateral damage spared. You deserve to take the quick route to Mako's place. At least this is what you tell yourself. Soon enough, you pull into her driveway and there she is. Her hair is still wet. <laughs> she probably showered a couple times trying to get the last of the sludge off. Even so, Mako is as lovely as always. She is wearing a long sleeve shirt, two sizes too big for her. It nearly hides her denim shorts. You toss her your spare helmet and she puts it on. She gets on your shoulder and wraps her arms around your waist a little tighter than she needs to. You find this incredibly adorable. You ask her if she's ready and she nods her head. Let's get some ice cream! You feel lucky. You're not sure if it's because you didn't get a single red light on the way downtown or if maybe there's something magical in the air but you can't help but feel like, like things are finally starting to look up. You wonder if Mako feels this too. It's hard to talk with the helmets on and with the sound of the city all around you, but you consider making a mental note to ask her later. But you decide against it. Why we're in the moment, right? Things are looking good. Let's enjoy them. Thanks to your strangely well-timed luck and the help of your trusty stallion, you arrive downtown. This part of town is still a little new to you. Sure, there was a time when you and the rest of the gang used to come here every weekend, but that's not the same. There are parts of downtown you've never been to. Too many crooked streets and snaking alleyways that you've never set foot on. Maybe it's for the best. There's something dirty about the city. You can feel it on the tip of your nose, and it's not the smog. There's something heavy lingering all around the city, but it's completely unseen. Maybe it's the remnants of some horrible spiritual battle that happened not so long ago. Or maybe it's you. None of your friends seem to notice this strange aura around the city. Maybe it is you after all. Maybe you're just looking for things to be wrong. It's hard knowing what you know, seeing what you can see. The truth never seemed that important to you, but now you can't help but long for simpler days. Is that truth? True sight. When you first found your powers, you and your friends were under the false assumption that only chosen people had the ability to project their Artemas. This was wrong. Everyone has Artemas. Everyone has access to the dreaming world. These are rules without exceptions. The difference is that only certain people have aligned the layers of their being. It's like the lenses of a telescope. When placed in the correct order, the truth is revealed. The lenses of the self may only be moved through willpower, or the human emotion known as desire, and in this way open a link between the, walk, the waking and the dreaming. It is this connection that allows the self to reject energy from one realm into another. This of course is not the only boon granted to those who find awakening. Those who have opened their eyes to the parallel form of the soul are also given the ability to see things for what they really are. You and your friends refer to this power as true sight. You can see projections of spiritual energy. You can see the monstrous creatures that hide not only in the darkness, but also in the hearts of men. Sometimes you find yourself seeing too much. There are people in the world, 
powerful people who project their automas without realizing it. Politicians, news anchors, and even everyday people like nurses and department store clerks. There are people out there who tilt the balance of the spiritual forces and they don't even know it. These people may sometimes use this luck for their own benefit, but more often than not, people are usually burdened by this. Terrible shadows loom over their shoulders, turning even the most mundane of things into triggers for heartache and sorrow. Truth. There are people who seek the truth above all else. You can see the truth. All your eyes see is the truth. Honestly, sometimes you wish you could turn the thing off. Man. Being a dream Power Ranger isn't as fun as it seems. You try to shake these thoughts out of your head as you park your scooter. You're a couple blocks away from your favorite ice cream parlor. It's a bit of a walk, but that's the best you're gonna get in the city. You feel Mako's arms ease around your waist. She's the first to get off the scooter. Suddenly, you hear the muffled sounds of a familiar voice. You rush to take your helmet off. You turn your head in the direction of the voice, and there, right beneath the shade of a store sign, you find an old friend. It's Kami! They must have used their automa to track you. Of course. You get off your scooter. You get off your scooter and walk over to Kami. Camilla. Camilla. Kami. Cami. Maybe Cami. Hey, I'll, I'll do. I'll do Cami. Camilla, or Cami for short, is one of your dearest friends. They are proactive, brave, and sometimes just a little too cool for their own good. But you love them regardless. Cami is leader material, even if they would never, ever boast about it. They don't like being the center of attention. Kami is much like you. They don't identify themselves with either gender. They wear whatever they want and behave however they want. To you, their company is a treasure because you see in their eyes a familiar sparkle. Life took both of you in different directions and yet somehow you've both ended up at the same place. That's so cool. If anything, Kami makes you feel like you made all the right choices, even the ones that felt like mistakes. They were all worth it in the end. Kami looks at you, but does not step out of the shade. Kami's tall, and they have very dark skin. Their head is shaved, and their makeup is spectacular. Nobody can pull off white eyeliner like Kami. Their line work is razor sharp. Oh, that sounds so cool. They're so cool! <laughs> you are certain that if you were to hold a finger to their wings, they would cut you. <laughs> Kami's wardrobe is a lot more varied than yours. Sometimes they're formal for seemingly no reason, and others they're cool with- they're casual with abandon. Today is a casual day. White skinny jeans, boots, and a band t-shirt older than most high school kids. Much like the rest of Cammy's casual tees, this one too has the sleeves torn off, perfectly showcasing the right muscle in their arms. Oh man, Cammy has guns! Fuck! They're so cool! <laughs> Cammy shoots you a wink. For a second, you see what appears to be the black out. For a second, you see what appears to be the outline of a black bird sitting on their shoulder. The instant your mind's eye recognizes what it is, it vanishes. Much like you, Kami has several automas at their command. That little bird is one of their most useful pawns. Operator. But it seems a little bit of a waste to track you and Mako all the way downtown. After all, you have phones. If Kami wanted to hang out, they could have just called. Unless. You feel a pinching sensation at the tip of your nose. Ask the hard question. You take a deep breath. You gather your thoughts as though loading bullets into a revolver. You're not the sheriff in this town, and your friends sure are deputies, but that doesn't mean you can just allow bad things to happen. How bad is it? Mako turns to look at you, and then back at Kami. It appears that she missed the bus both you and Kami are on. Truth be told, you can see where your next stop is, and you wish you could get off. Kami lets out a sigh and steps out from the shade. Their voice is harsh, cold, and fact. You find solace in this voice because Sammy does not glorify, Tammy does not or glorify or embellish. They state fact. They measure once and cut twice. <clears throat> we have trouble. Kami begins. I send out operator to check in on all of you, make sure nothing funny had happened since we split this morning. Mako looks at you, then at Kami. Is everyone okay? She asks. Her voice trembles for a moment. I haven't heard from Keen. Did, did you check on him? 
Cammy waves a hand as though to wipe several words off a whiteboard. Kane is fine. He's sleeping at my place right now. Last night was hard on him. I told him to sleep in. You connect the dots. If you and your friends are fine, then where exactly did the trouble come from? Of course, Cammy is always one step ahead of you. They open their mouth and deliver a handful of bad news. On their way back, Operator sensed a flux in this part of town. I was already out the door when I told it to let you and Mako know, but lo and behold, you two were already en route. Cammy narrowed their eyes. I take it you two were about to hit the arcade? Sorry, but button mashing is going to have to wait. You were always more of a DDR kind of person, but you weren't about to argue semantics with Cammy. At least, not right this minute. It hasn't manifested yet, Cammy says. I know that the flux is centered around this area, but I'm not sure where. We should probably split up and cover as much ground as we can. I'll keep Operator up in the air just to be safe. You hear a low sigh. It's Mako. She was probably looking forward to a few hours of peace. You were too, but no use crying over spilled ice cream. You turn to look at Cammy and ask a question that hasn't been answered yet. What are we going up against? Cammy sighs. No idea. It's all dream energy. Operator can't tell if it's an awakening or a rogue automa or something we've never seen before. Out of the corner of your vision, you notice, you notice Mako shaking her head. You turn to look at her and find her expression transformed. The sweet, gentle look on her face is no more. Her eyebrows are wrinkled together. Her mouth is pressed into a hard line. She's serious. She has to. You're all about to step into the unknown against a thing that may just kill you if you let it. You... You hate seeing Mako like that. But you also understand why she puts on that mask. A face that's not hers, but rather the face of a part of Mako. Loveless. To wear a mask, there is nothing more human than that. Man, this is so Persona! I fucking love it! You hate that reality. You hate it because it's right. This is what you have to do. You take a deep breath. You begin to center yourself. One by one, the lenses of your being begin to focus. For a second, you see the sight of a familiar desert. The place that exists deep within you, within the undying fabric of the soul. A sky as black as your hair. Sand as white as your skin. And there, in this pocket dimension only you know, you find the sight of a wondrous mirage. You see the floor of two strangers, one red, the other blue. These two people hold each other close. They dance, they kiss, they are caught up in the dream. It's time for you to wake them up. You open your eyes and find yourself back in the waking world. Next to you is your lovely friend Mako. In front of you is the resourceful Kami. All of you seem a little different than before. The color in your eyes seem deeper, darker, as though each orb contained within it is a unique, starry sky. You feel a familiar energy surging through your body. This is your body, the one you've had all your life, and yet you feel it as though for the first time. You blink your eyes and see momentary sparks of electricity snaking their way around your arms and legs. They're there one second, and then they're gone. Deep within your mind, you hear two foreign voices. They sound like you, and yet they don't at the same time. One is harsher, the other sweeter. You feel their words resonate below your skin. The harsh voice speaks first. When they speak, all you can see is red. Red stone, red walls, bloodied clothes, and crimson banners. Let me be your voice, master. You blink your eyes and see before you a projection of your real self. They are humanoid in nature, though their body does not seem restricted to the bounds of, n of nature. They have red skin and their wild hair stands on ends as though a dancing red flame. This strange person has a beautiful slender body and they wear no clothing, not even a loincloth. Their breasts and sex are bare. The only item on their body is a belt of large beads around their waist. This shard of you is called Maze. They are the master of the labyrinth. They are a shard of you that once lived in a cruel world. And through words, you learn to weave lies and deceit, as well as love and candor. Maze opens their mouth and smiles. You are once again reminded that Maze has rather large canines. Maze bows and fades out of view. A softer voice and outline takes their place. As they speak, your eyes are filled with visions of blue, blue fountains, buildings made of blue stone, 
in the tight little blue alleyways where you made your playground and where murder was your game. I am ready. Before your very eyes emerges another projection of your real self. A mirage of bubbles dissipates into a humanoid frame. Their chest and legs are covered in a mess of leather straps and belt buckles. Their arms are exposed and with it reveal a skin almost too pale, practically blue. This person's hair is a mess of darks and blues. It covers most of their face except for their lips. Thin, tender, unkissed. You do not know what this shard of you is called. All you know of them is the name of the sword behind their back. Days. In a different time, in a different place, the shard of you is tasked with murder. You were an amazing assassin, but you never, not once, spilled the blood of your targets. Violence needs not end in murder. You know this very well. You offer a silent nod to Days, and they return the gesture before vanishing. You are now complete. The two shards of your true self have emerged from the desert of your soul. No labyrinth can trap you. No threat dares scare you. Your body may be mortal, but right now, you are anything but human. You are ready. Okay. So, I've been recording for a little while. So I'm going to go ahead and stop this here. Uh, we can come back to this in the next episode. So, um, I will go ahead and leave a, a link to this in the description if you'd like to play it for yourselves. Um, but until next time, I really appreciate you watching and checking me out, and I'll see you later.